Hello, friends. Welcome to Magic, Creativity, and Life. Interesting conversations with interesting people. My name is T. Thorne Coyle, and I am your host. Thank you for joining me, and thank you to my Patreon supporters for paying for the recording and captioning of this series. Let's dive in. Hello, everybody. I'm here today with Meg Ellison, and Meg is a Hugo, Philip K. Dick, and Locus Award winning author, as well as a Nebula, Sturgeon, and Otherwise Awards finalist. A prolific short story writer and essayist, Ellison has been published in Scientific American, McSweeney's, Fantasy and Science Fiction, Fangoria, and Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy. Ellison is a high school dropout and a graduate of UC Berkeley. She lives in Brooklyn. And you can find out more about Meg at MegEllison.com. That's E-L-I-S-O-N. So welcome to the show, Meg. Thanks for joining me. I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for having me. So first of all, I had to laugh when I read your bio because I am also a high school dropout. <laughs> Love to hear it. <laughs> and so I just think that's interesting that here we are, two professional writers who dropped out of high school. Why did you drop out of high school, if you don't mind sharing? I don't mind at all. I was living in pretty extreme poverty, and uh, my mom at the time left the state, and I didn't want to follow. So I stayed where I was, and I worked for a room and board, and it was very difficult under those circumstances to finish. So I carried it as far as I could, and then I had to work full time in order to support myself. So that was the end of high school. Wow. Yeah. What happened with you? Um, I just really loathed high school. It was... A waste of my time you know i was too smart too awkward you know too whatever um and i wanted to leave when i was 15 and my parents forced me to stay until i was 16. Mm -hmm. so i did that and then dropped out went to community college for a couple of years fled to san francisco as soon as i turned 18 and dropped out of college <laughs> Finally went back to college in my late 20s, early 30s um, to get my philosophy and religion degree. So here we are. I went back to school about the same time. And there's way more of us than you might think. And after I dropped out, I really needed to hear that. So I want to keep that in my bio for as long as I feasibly can. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Well, so just to give a little context for people, the reason I wanted to have you on the show is you're a novelist, short story writer, essayist. You also express creativity through fashion, and I'm sure a lot of other ways too. Um, so I want you to tell us about other forms of creativity and how creativity weaves through your life. I think it's important to have a form of creativity that you don't monetize or even necessarily show people. I love that I make a living as an author and my work is very important to me, but that puts a different sort of pressure on creating that kind of work. Right. So, I'm also a really good cook, and that doesn't have to go on Instagram or make any money for me. And I'm a really bad pianist. And it's great to be bad at something and to pursue it as a true amateur with an amateur spirit and to see myself get incrementally better without the added pressure of a, an outside audience. So, I'm loving that part of my creative flow right now. That's cool. Yeah, I'm an amateur photographer, which I do post to Instagram, but people sometimes say to me, are you going to publish your phot photographs? Are you going to have a show? I said, no, like I'm very clear. It's just for me and whoever happens to stumble across my social media and enjoy what I'm doing. Just let me live. Just let me have one thing unobserved. Yes. Yeah. It's interesting because since I've been a creative person my whole life, I've not really had hobbies. The only hobby I had was when I was going to a lot of anarchist meetings, I did a lot of embroidery to keep my keep from stabbing people, <laughs> right? The endless meetings, endless consensus meetings. Um, but since then, I realized I hadn't had hobbies for a long time. I was getting into the habit of monetizing everything. And you're right, it's not great. So I'm really happy to have picked up photography because like I've monetized my music, you know, everything. It gets to be oppressive. Like I, I love reading and I used to tell people reading was my hobby. And then being a writer is like 80% reading. So reading yes. is my job now. And I still enjoy it a great deal. But when someone asks me about my hobby, I feel 
not quite right saying that I read for pleasure because I do, but I'm on the clock the whole time. Yeah. 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 I get that. Um, so the other question I wanted to ask you is what does the word magic mean to you? Mm. This is definitely a word that's taken on a lot of different definitions throughout my life. I've gone all the way from like a pretty hermetic description of magic as the etheric attempt on behalf of the physical body to change probability through force of will to the power to bend reality or to change consciousness, which was the working definition for most of us in the pagan community for a long time, to thinking of it as the last resort of the unheard of the powerless. And sometimes I still think it's that. At this point in my life, as much as I make my living with words, I find it almost impossible to describe what magic is. It is an energy and a sense for that energy that all human beings have that we are capable of interacting with and acting upon that we do not have the right words for yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what I got. Mm -hmm. Well, and your definition of... um the last cry of the powerless, however you put that, that seems to weave its way through your writing. It definitely does, yes. So do you consider writing to be a form of magic? It always is because you are forming a connection with another mind that neither one of you can see. And you have to form that connection across space, across time, sometimes across language barriers, which requires another magician, the translator. Right. I've heard it compared to all kinds of things. I've heard it described as sex, as community, as it is communion. It is communitas. I'll take that, but it is absolutely magic along the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense to me. Um, the other thing about your writing is you weave in, that also relates to your one definition of magic, um, the last cry of the powerless, is you weave in a lot of what some people might call social issues, right? Yeah. Um, it, and it almost doesn't matter what genre you're writing, fiction, nonfiction, you know, you're writing about um, abortion, you're writing about gender, you're writing about fame and, and public scrutiny. Um, so do you consider writing to be a form of activism is that not the right word or is it just part of how you're trying to make sense of the world what's going on for you in weaving all of those topics through your work or do they just arise naturally right i would say it's actually all those things i would say my social consciousness arises naturally from the world and my relationship to it I would say that it naturally forms part of all of my work because of that. It shows up in my art because it reflects the life that I live. And it is also absolutely activism. I am trying to speak to people who already know about this and need encouragement, need another note of connection or who don't know yet to whom I can be, you know, the town crier and say what time it is. There's a, there's a Mexican artist whose name I can never remember when I need it most, who builds large scale installation art. And one of his best pieces is a brick wall. And underneath one small part of the brick wall, he set uh, a hard a book you know piece I'm talking about. Yeah, I do. And it warps the entire shape of the wall. Like you can see the, uh, the rippling effect through not only the bricks directly above it, but all the bricks that touch those bricks and so on, because they're all connected. That's what I think about when I'm trying to write books that matter, that can change someone's mind or help them understand something they didn't understand before. I can ripple the wall. I'm not a brick, I'm not a mason, but I can ripple the wall. That's what I want. And that reminds me of, to paraphrase James Baldwin, talking about, you know, you think you're the only one having your experience in life, and then, and then you, you read. read. <laughs> I love and, that. And that's reflected back to you, you know? And so the magic for me of writing is its world-changing ability. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, I can despair because the world is a harsh difficult place and it's like well you know I used to be out in the streets all the time I used to be blockading doing that sort of activism with my health and my brain injury and all of that I can't really do that anymore um and so occasionally I say is my writing enough you know and I have to remind myself my writing is 
my best form of culture change, right? And so when I think that I'm working on the long trajectory rather than the short immediate trajectory, that calms that part of me down that feels like I'm not doing enough. But, you know, I love your bringing up the image of the book uh, changing the shape of the wall because the power of art and the magic of art is that ability you're talking about. That's exactly it. And that works for a long time. And books have a long, if they're lucky, they have a long shelf life and people find them. I found books hundreds of years after they were written that changed my life that rippled the wall for me. It's a small object and it can't be everything, but it can be something to a lot of people. Jorge Mendez Blake is the uh, the artist. Oh, thank you for that. going to drive me nuts. <laughs> Yeah. So what else about writing? When did you start to write? Very early. There are only two things I've ever wanted to be in my life. When I was very young, I wanted to be an opera singer because my parents had a bunch of Maria Callas records and I could wow. sing it. And it just seemed so opulent and dramatic and everything I hoped to be. Well, <laughs> you are opulent and dramatic. <laughs> yeah. Meg. I think that worked out all right, but I'm not Maria Callas and that's for the best. But I loved that kind of music and I thought, yeah, that's what I want to do. And then when I was about 10, I discovered that I wanted to write. I had a, a series of moving experiences with books, uh, mostly because of the Scholastic Book Fair and the Bookmobile. Wow. I bought a pocket Penguin Classics copy of the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam and gained a great deal of my cosmology from it, as incorrect as it is, as colonialist as it is, it right. didn't feel to me. And from there on out, all I wanted to do was write. So I started writing. Then I wrote these terrible little Ramana Clef novels about it, loosely based on my classmates in a fantasy setting. And I would enter every school writing contest, every poetry contest, every little essay contest. They could shuttle my way. And I, I got good at it in a way that most hyper lexical weirdo little kids who read all the time are. Right. <laughs> I've been developing it at one level or another since then. Very cool. Yeah, I've been writing since I was a child also. It seems to be a thing for a lot of us. Yes, I think it is. Yeah. People used to ask me all the time if my parents or one of my parents was an English teacher, which as a you know a child of felons, I thought was hysterical. No, actually. Yeah, and I come from a really working class or family. Um, so it's like, no, you know. <laughs> it's funny to, to figure out what someone imagines your life might have been based mm -hmm. on become mm -hmm. and you have to say yeah. no I built this myself yeah that's terrific um what is your current why for creativity and magic why is really hard mm -hmm. as a person who believes prime in the primacy of this world of this life of living in this meat body and probably no other ever again it is difficult to say why with anything. It's really hard to describe why you live a life structured for the benefit of tomorrow when all you have is today and you may as well eat eight cans of whipped cream and see how it goes. <laughs> right. So there are a few principles that I can prove to myself are important based on the compass of my desire. I find it pleasurable to write. I find it pleasurable to read. I find it intensely pleasurable to be read, to wake up to fan mail from New Zealand, like I did this morning, and to be understood. And that's maybe the best way to get at that. Saying things with your mouth is much harder than writing them down. Yeah. <laughs> I find it pleasurable to see books with my name on the spine on shelves. I find it pleasurable to be translated with those books into languages I myself do not speak. I find it pleasurable to contemplate and sometimes arrive at a future where there are more of those books these pleasures don't harm anyone. <laughs> they occasionally do good things for other people, including the other artists involved in the process, the typesetters, the cover designers, the publishers. And occasionally it does even more good than that, as in the cases where I get letters from people who have come to understand their non-binary grandchildren better because some of the books that I've written. All of those things I can prove, I can lay my hand on, I can justify. It's difficult right. to get that degree of surety from any other kind of work. Right. 
I appreciate that your why includes the word pleasure. Mm. Because too often we think our why has to be some large, grandiose, earth-shaking thing. And some people end up feeling badly about their lives and what they're doing in their lives or their creativity, their creative process or anything, you know, because it doesn't feel big enough. It doesn't. And, and the disconnect go ahead. Between, sorry, the disconnect between your day to day and those lofty ideals makes you miserable. And yes. there's no, no better place to learn that than Silicon Valley. Right. I worked for these lofty idealists who really thought, really thought they were changing the world by revolutionizing taxis or revolutionizing fiat currency. Right. And they, to the last, even though they were millionaires, billionaires sometimes, they were miserable, anorexic, empty people devoid of the pleasure that would have bridged them from the self to that ideal. Well, and the thing I've also noticed about those people is they are thinking in grandiose terms for grandiosity's sake. Yes. Rather than for a real purpose. I once sat in a, a gathering of some of those people mm -hmm. and they were all, it was when they were all talking about disruption. And I looked at them and I was like, you people are disrupting nothing right? You're not disrupting anything that's at the core or the base level. You're disrupting tiny things and acting as if one guy started quoting, one white dude started quoting Ho Chi Minh. And I was like, you, you really need to stop. No, but they're the same guy. They're both obsessed with the great man archetype and how to become him and the great revolution of making themselves rich. And it's laughable looking back how many times I saw that same moment. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, and I just shook my head because I was like, you are not Ho Chi Minh and you never will be. And Thank the God. things you're doing, the things you're doing, right, you're not revolutionizing anything. Um, so can you claim what you are doing, right? You know, my mantra that I continuously return to is do what you can, when you can, where you can. That's great. I love that. Right. And I wish some people who had grandiose lofty aspirations got more granular and said I am going to do my best to affect this one thing like the book in the wall right what yeah. can you do right here right now not how much venture capital will it take you to have a five-year plan right right <laughs> yeah so pleasure bringing that back into the conversation feels like a good antidote to some of that grandiosity because pleasure is simple it is right it's, it's like affirming oh it's this it's the grape between my teeth oh it's the flower on my walk you know it's the scent of jasmine it's that snatch of music right and if you really, if you are honest with yourself and can observe your own reactions, if you can determine when you are honestly feeling pleasure and not when you're fulfilling obligation, not when you're performing a type, not when you're being of service to someone else, which are all different things. If you can truly identify those things that bring you pleasure, it becomes the guiding force of your life. There's nothing else that's worthwhile. And it'll tell you when you're in the wrong situation, when you've made the wrong decision, when you're associating with the wrong people, because it evaporates. What has helped bring you to that place where you can accurately gauge? Therapy, frankly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Great deal of, of therapy that I was privileged enough to have access to in my 30s, which helped me free myself of what I like to think of as bad programming. Right. I think of I'm, I'm running old subroutines on a very old computer, and a lot of them are broken, and a lot of them right. are installed by people who weren't going to have to work on this system in 30 years like I am. Right. So understanding that you are the system, that you own the system, that you get to delete any subroutines you want and reset to what actually works makes a big difference. So I had an excellent therapist through most of my 30s and also a great deal of self-reflective work. I'm, I'm a, a journal keeper and I uh, practice a great deal of, of magic uh, in groups and on a solitary basis and that is another tool when wielded with great honesty can lead you to your actual desires. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was raised to 
be good, right? Part partially to keep from uh, terrible consequences, right? right? Random random acts of violence um, instead of instead of random acts of kindness, and it definitely took me time to grow into a sense that pleasure is good and pleasure is necessary and that I can and should have pleasure in my yes. life. Um, and again, that it didn't have to be big, that it really was all the small things that that make up the web of life that give me pleasure. And that my part in the world can offer some pleasure too, right? Because sure, some of my writing tackles deep philosophical you know, questions just like yours does. Exactly. And some of my writing is like, have something sweet because damn it, life is hard. The thing that I love most about your work is when mutually supportive groups of people find moments to just enjoy each other. Like you write people dancing in a way that I really love because it oh, thanks. themselves in each other and and the real joy of a spontaneous moment. And, and you're great at that. And I think that without that web work of small pleasures, you don't discover the big ones. You're not on the right tracks. So you don't get led to the center of the web. Right. So in the world we're currently living in, where there's so much pain and suffering and horrific things happening, um, what is the role of pleasure in the midst of all that for you that is a difficult one because a life in pursuit of pleasure is necessarily selfish and it takes guts to recognize the difference between pleasure and intentional ignorance it may feel pleasurable to ignore terrible things but what you're actually feeling is relief right which is a different sensation and has a different meaning and leads you in a different direction. So it brings me no pleasure to ignore terrible things happening close to me or far away from me, but it does bring me relief and sometimes comfort and parsing those things out and figuring out how to be brave and how to follow my own sense of pleasure in justice and follow the ability to create moments of pleasure for others toward making that justice happen is part of the work. Mm. It's usually further steps away than the grape mm -hmm. but it's just as necessary mm -hmm. I mean Adrian Marie Brown of course talks about that a lot right yes. it's a it's the core of her work um is to not be not be in uh, states of self-abnegation in order to bring about justice right that pleasure needs to be part of the work we're doing as communities right and when when community action whatever it is, is at its best, it includes those moments of pleasure. It does, yes. Coming yeah. together and eating, coming together and playing music, those sorts of gatherings, right? It can't all be a grind. It must not be. I mean, the, the ones who want the constant grind and absolute vigilance and total discipline are the fascists. The right. rest of us are figuring out how to feed each other's babies and make sure that there's music on. Right. So we're talking about Emma Goldman's beautiful, radiant things. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. Um, so I'm going to steer us back into your fiction because I love that you talked about writing being pleasurable to you and people reading your work being pleasurable to you. And that's true even in your novels that tackle really hard things. Yes. Right. And those same novels also have a sense of wonder that moves through them that feels really key to you and who you are in the world. Is that accurate? That is extremely accurate. Yes. And I, I will caution anybody who's not read my work before that my novels are often grim and really bad things happen in them. And I write a lot about sexual assault and reproductive justice and the necessity of bodily autonomy and the difficulty of living in an unruly body and poverty and real bummer subjects I promise <laughs> and it's 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 pleasurable to me to write even about those things because I get to tell the truth inside the lie which is the work mm -hmm. of fiction mm -hmm. and because it creates contrast to when I write moments of pleasure for characters so that you can truly enjoy it because you know what they've been through. Mm -hmm. 
So it's life. It's life. It's just like life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks for that. That's terrific. Um, I'm pausing here because we've already talked about so much that was on my agenda to talk about. <laughs> right, I talk fast and I don't waste a lot of words. <laughs> no, I'm I'm the same way. Um, no, it's it's ter it's terrific. I I love it. Um, so where I want to go next is first of all, what's next for you? Uh, writing wise, are you working on a large project? Are you working on some small projects? What's happening? I am working on a large project, actually several. I just finished a horror novel about dentists. Oh my gosh. <laughs> like most people who grew up in poverty, I am afraid of the dentist and I expect to be both in physical discomfort and a great deal of shame when I encounter them. Right. Which is pretty fertile ground for a horror novel. Yeah. I've also been writing a great deal about the nature of the individual in fiction and what it means to be a person and how differently that's viewed in different cultures, what your responsibility is to the collective versus your own destiny. And those are weighty subjects and what better way to get at them than science fiction and horror. So there will be lots more of that. I've also been doing a great deal of work for a couple of magazines and that keeps me busy these days, but I am always writing a novel. Yeah. And what's next for you or current for you magically, if you can share anything? I, since I moved across country, I was very fortunate that my particular um, branch of Wicca is well represented on the East Coast to where I've moved. So I was able to land with not one, but several covens that were open to me coming and joining, either visiting or staying there. So I am very pleased and very lucky and excited to get back into keeping a regular calendar with group practice. Uh, it's difficult through the big holidays at the end of the year, but I'm looking forward to spring. I miss, I miss being with my fellows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you have a core spiritual practice that helps you? This is always difficult for me to define because spiritual practice has meant so many things throughout my life. But going back to before I had a definition of these things or before I accepted somebody else's framework for it, my core practice has been gratitude. Yeah. There are always things to be grateful for, even when I've been at my most miserable, my most abject, my most pained. And it's it's not to say that you shouldn't pay attention to things that suck. You should. But it has been a source of calm and comfort and joy for me to consistently return to those things that I'm grateful for. And more than that, to assign that gratitude to the person or people who helped me to have it. It helps me stay connected to the people around me and it helps me to stay grounded in the things that I can use. That's really helpful, thanks. Yeah, that's a major practice for me too, so. I think it really works. I appreciate that reflection. So, the other thing I want to bring up is one of the things that I find delightful about your presence in the world are your fat vanity posts. Yes. You know, I often comment that, oh, you're you're working your 50s, you know, film goddess vibes again today. Um, so you're it's your combination of fashion and, you know, joy in the world and looking good and pleasure and all of those things rolled together in one magical package. And I'm wondering if you have any reflections to say about that process. What's that been like for you to make your fashion posts and your fat vanity posts? And what is your relation? What is the relationship you have uh, between vanity and pleasure? Mm. It's been nothing short of revolutionary. And I know to a lot of people that sounds simplistic or perhaps uh, obsessed with symbol or surface, but I have not found anything more powerful in this life than falling in love with myself and the image of myself. You can't take good care of a body that you hate. You cannot be hard on yourself until you're better. Neither one of those things works. What works is caring for yourself and loving yourself and believing in yourself, not only as a being worthy of care, but as something great. Mm. 
and uh, I take great pleasure in my vanity. I take great pleasure in good clothes and uh, frankly, being pretty. It's definitely worth it. If you're the kind of person who likes to be pretty, you should pursue that with all due haste. <laughs> it's it's a major mind fuck to be as fat as I am and as vain as I am. And I love what that does to people, both people who need it and people who are frightened by it. Mm. <laughs> and I get to accept a, a great deal of compliments and confusion and questions and mm -hmm. the occasional confession from people who have to contend suddenly with what my existence means for them. That's not a path for everybody. And you certainly don't have to do the work if you just want to be cute, but I really welcome it. And by embracing my own image and my sense of fashion and frankly, my vanity for my own goddamn face, it's made so many opportunities for me to enjoy that. And to, there is a moment for everyone who reaches this level of self-love and beauty where you become iconic. It's a dead word. I know everybody's throwing it around these days, but you literally light someone up in the way that a religious icon does. Right. And they look at you as something not quite human, something more. You can be very symbolic to them because of that. It right. is an incredibly powerful moment and I love doing it. Again, and it's just a moment. It is. It doesn't last. Right. But but it's the power of the moment, you know, and sometimes that's all we have Yep. with each other. It's just when the light is right. Yeah. Yeah. I it's, love that. It's amazing. Yeah. It's it is one of the best things that I get to do. Also difficult to describe. It's not rippling the wall, but it means a lot to a lot of people, including me. I think it is rippling the wall. In right. what way is it not rippling the wall? I think because it doesn't, for the most part, it doesn't last in the same way. Like you can argue that that kind of iconography, like, you know, the best photos of Marilyn Monroe, which will never fall off and die, that people will be painting those on walls long after the fall of civilization. In some cases, the image of the body endures in that way. I've uh, I've caught enough people at the right moment that they realize the Venus of Willendorf is in the room with them. The likelihood, however, of that lasting is statistically less than a book. I see. I see. So it's not rippling the wall in the way that your books do, but it does ripple. It is. It it is. It is consciousness changing. Yes. And it is therefore part of the longer cultural change project. Yes. Right. So it's it's affecting individuals in a moment, um, and then it goes away. Right. Absolutely. And the, the moment is very important, but yes, it is fleeting. And it would be remiss of me not to mention that in order to adjust my consciousness to this way of thinking about myself and about the body in general, it took reading a great deal of Black scholarship about the body. Mm -hmm. Books that I always refer people to are Fearing the Black Body, especially for fat people, especially for fat white people. And The Body is Not an Apology by Sonia Renee yeah. Taylor. Yeah. yeah. Body is Not a, an Apology is beautiful work. Beautiful, great book, life changing, much better than the body keeps the score. Get the book. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that. Um, I appreciate you bringing up black writers, black thinkers, black scholars into this conversation because, of course, um, the black body has been so a commodified and then modified, reject, rejected, rejected, uh, vi vilified, thing. fetishized. Yes. yes all of the above. Um, so that's, that's important. It occurred to me, I think pretty late in life, but I'm glad that I learned it, that the best way to learn the ownership of your body is to seek out the scholarship of people who have been denied ownership of theirs. They're much further along in this journey than you, you are usually. So reading black authors and trans authors too has really revolutionized my thinking. Yeah. 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 Well, and so that's another way um another ripple in the wall right yes. um we're all changing each other by encountering each other so that feels like a key point to me about how can we better open ourselves to have a wider variety of encounters right outside of what is familiar to us and for me i often think creative people not always but often we seek out what is unusual to us right we seek out what feels foreign what feels different and 
if we do well, we can center ourselves and say, what's really happening here? Yes. Beyond my reaction and my response, right? What's the deeper thing that this person is offering and trying to transmit? Yeah. Right. Do you have any um, keys or suggestions for people who might not be used to doing this sort of activity for an entry point? Yeah, I have two things. My first thing is take one step out of your lane. You don't have to go so far that it scares you. I don't think that that's necessarily healthy for everybody. But one thing you wouldn't normally do, a place you wouldn't normally go, or if you are an artist, a discipline that's not yours, to get out of your own head to force yourself into the amateur's way of thinking. You're not an expert. You don't know what's going on here. Get slightly out of your normal track. The other thing is what you said, the difference between reaction and response. Lots of people have not learned how to parse that or slow that, and they still perceive those two things as one. Their right. response is their reaction. And this is applicable to literally everything in life, to to conversations where you might be conveying judgment where you don't mean to to interaction with your children or with your parents to i mean how you react in a in an emergency in a difficult situation reaction comes first it is often based on your conditioning on those old subroutines on the things that you did not install in yourself your response is the thing you get to own it's the thing you get to take at least a microsecond to think about your reaction to art is the exact same thing your first reaction, your gut reaction, the way it makes you feel is something you didn't create. It's how you came to it with all of your baggage and how you fit your bags on the bus. Right. S sitting with your response until it's what you mean to say, how you mean to respond is difficult. It's really hard to master. I'm impatient and I like to talk fast and I like to have witty retorts. <laughs> Learning to be patient enough to make the difference between those two things has been the work of at least a decade and I still mess it up. Mm -hmm. I, I would tell everybody, artist or not, to learn to take those two things apart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the practice for me can be as simple as pausing to take a conscious breath. It, right. So it buys me just a few seconds of time. And that tiny bit of distance is useful for my ego Mm -hmm. and all my training, right? To say, oh, there's something in the world outside my training. There's something in the world outside my inculcation, right? There's something in the world that exists outside of my family dynamic, my birth family dynamic, right? Um, and the thing you said that feels really important is yes, and then you get to choose. You get to choose which right. I know a lot of people feel trapped in their reactions to things because it's big feelings. A lot of the time it's shame and guilt and anger and defensiveness, and they feel too big to get around. Learning to take just a little bit of time away from those things gives you back your decision, your control, your choice. Right. And, you know, for me, that is also true of both my creativity what am I going to work on and why, yes. you know, do I feel like working on it today? Am I, am I resisting something or do I actually need some rest? Right. And I need to parse the difference between those things. Are you reacting to scarcity? Are you thinking I need to make money next year? Are you thinking everybody's writing vampires? Nothing good comes of those reactionary. Right, thoughts. right, right. I will say it's it's self-reinforcing because the the first time learning to parse those two things help, keeps you from saying something you wish you hadn't said. Yes. You feel like a god. <laughs> I stopped myself from saying something embarrassing. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it works in those larger decisions like what you're going to do next in your career or even how you represent your work. A reactionary representation of work has gotten more than one person in a lot of trouble. Well, that's for sure. Yeah. A million cases of that. God. And, you know, it's also true for me with magic, I think, mm -hmm. right? Yes. What is this magical act? What is my intention? Why is my intention? And is that really what I want, need, or desire? You know, and focusing on parsing the difference between want need and desire has been important for me and then also the work of a decade 
Yes, yes, indeed. And then because we're not, we're not allowed to some in some cases, we're not allowed to want things in other cases, we're not allowed to need things. So people often switch those words. Yes. To try to lighten to get whatever around those rules to get around the rules. Yes. yes. And then let alone desire, which circles us back to pleasure, right? And what? there's so many rules around that. Yeah. Right. And, you know, what is my deeper desire? What is that place where want and need come together in me and want something more, you know? Yes. I, I told a friend of mine not too long ago that I think my 20s were about figuring out what I like. And then my 30s were about learning to like what I like. And so for my 40s have been about learning to like liking what I actually like. <laughs> because of the rules around pleasure because what are you allowed to want what are you allowed to need what what if what has someone told you you're allowed to desire it is harder than you think to know those things yeah yeah and everything good comes from them yeah and my hope is that we can all find our way to pleasure no matter what our current conditions are and no matter how fleeting it may feel you know Every moment of pleasure feel is important. It's worth it. On the, the worst days of my life, like making a cup of tea has made a huge difference. Even <laughs> getting arrested in protest and having your right. arm uh, zip tied behind your back, figuring out that you can help somebody unzip their parka by biting their zipper and having them pull away and then wadding up your jacket behind your hands. Incredibly pleasurable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, small acts of resistance and mutual aid are pleasurable. That's it, that whole process, figuring it out, having the the satisfaction of getting it right, the satisfaction of helping somebody out, the minute relief of feeling not as uncomfortable as you were a minute ago. It is yeah. that simple, it is that important, and it is that complex. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. That's beautiful. Yeah. So... Before we close, any last thoughts on creativity or magic or life? I would say that one of the hardest things for most artists to deal with is jealousy, professional and interpersonal. You know, everybody says comparison is the thief of joy, but you're going to do it anyway. So the thing that I have learned is jealousy works best as a compass. It is pointing you towards something you want. You may not be comfortable with that wanting. You may be very upset at yourself that you wish you could take it from someone else. You may feel unkind and ungenerous that you are drawn primarily to what someone else has. Let those feelings pass over you. They're just part of being a person. And then look carefully where that compass points. It's going to lead you to pleasure. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So once again, I've been talking with Meg Ellison, and you can find her work at megellison.com, and you can find me at thorncoil.com. I hope everyone has a magical, creative day. Thank you for joining me. I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. And if you would like to support this series and future podcasts, please join me at patreon.com slash thorncoil. That's T-H-O-R-N. C-O-Y-L-E.